Uh -huh. This conference will now be recorded. <laughs> My name is Laura Aston, and I'll be moderating today's panel discussion uh, as we explore the topic of low emission vehicles and the government's role in incentivizing the transition to low emission vehicle. With our panel today, we've got six amazing speakers, and I'll get to that just shortly. Uh, Today's panel discussion is brought to you by the Institute of Transportation Engineers Australia and New Zealand, uh, and we're a member-based organisation with members across the world in 75 countries. Today, as I mentioned, we have six speakers. You'll be hearing from them very shortly, uh, and so I'll leave it till that moment for them to introduce themselves. Uh, my name's Laura, as I said, and I'm from Monash University. I do just want to mention before we get underway that there is uh, a, an award open that the ITE is running, the Young ITE Road to Recovery Awards, uh, and you can nominate for those via the link, which you'll find on our LinkedIn account and on the screen at the moment. We wouldn't be able to bring you these events if it wasn't for our sponsors. So I'd just like to take a moment to reflect uh, on our sponsors who make it possible for these to go ahead. So uh, just, just quickly, um, one moment while I end the screen share. There we go. Um, I would ask if you're not speaking to do, please mute yourself. So that goes for the audience members. Um, you're welcome to keep your video on or you can take it off. It, it, it's totally up to you. And we'll be, we'll be watching our six panelists today. So they'll have their videos on, but the audience members, that's up to you. Before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that um, the ITE ANZ recognises the Australian First Nations people as the traditional owners on the land on which we come to you today across Australia. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, our panellists to give themselves a brief introduction. We're on a very tight schedule today and you've submitted so many fantastic questions for this event that we won't have the opportunity to get through them all. So we've shortlisted what we feel are the ones that represent the diversity of issues and complexities on this topic of low emission vehicles. And those are the ones that we're going to be fielding to our panelists today. And so they're going to start us off with a, a very short introduction to themselves and the perspective that they bring to this topic today. Firstly, I'll call upon Steve Connors from Infrastructure Victoria. Hi everyone, uh, Steve Connors here. Uh, as Laura mentioned, I'm from, I'm from Infrastructure Victoria. Uh, I am the author of Infrastructure Victoria's advice on automated and zero emissions vehicles from 2019. At the moment, I'm working on uh, our update to our 30 year infrastructure strategy, focusing on our recommendations around promoting zero emissions vehicle uptake. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Ange Anchevska from the UITP ANZ. which is the Institute for Public Transport. And we can't hear you at the moment. Hello, I am Andre Antoska, General Manager of the International Association of Public Transport in Australia and New Zealand, uh, known colloquially as the UITP ANZ, a bit of a French acronym for the UITP part. Um, just a bit about the association. Globally, UITP does have 1,800 members, so it is an association that is comprised of organizations from over 100 countries uh, with 16 regional offices. So we cover all modes of sustainable transport, including rail, light rail, bus, uh, active transport, on-demand services, essentially on a mission to redefine public transport to mean everything except a single-use private passenger vehicle. So we advocate, uh, share knowledge, and create networking opportunities for our members, of which we have about 90 in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we're governed by a board of directors, which includes representatives from government and industry uh, across both of those two countries. 
and just a bit about some of our key focus areas presently. Uh, we're working on rebuilding customer confidence, which has been impacted by customer 19, uh, COVID-19 and public transport. And to that end, we're working closely with our members to share knowledge and experiences through events such as roundtables, webinars, and masterclasses. Uh, we also have a strong focus on women in transport and a podcast, Women Who Move Nations, featuring interviews with female transport leaders from across the globe and now a strong focus on zero emission transport. Um, in late 2020, we hosted Australia's first zero emissions bus forum in partnership with Transport for New South Wales, Air and LEK Consulting. And we recently released a report uh, on the key findings of that forum. So I'm really excited to be here today to share the public transport perspective on zero emissions vehicles with the specific emphasis on zero emissions buses, uh, which are going through a big step change in our region at the moment. So exciting! it is exciting to see uh, Australian states and territories and New Zealand make commitments regarding ZEBs, as I call them, some people say ZEB, whatever your preference is, uh, and then sending out strong signals to the market. And we've already seen some battery electric uh, bus trials roll out in New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, and Canberra, uh, with New Zealand now also manufacturing and trialing hydrogen buses. And I'm sure we'll touch on some of that uh, as part of the Q&A. So thank you for having me, and I'm looking forward to participating in the conversation. Thank you very much, Anjie. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Alina Dini from uh, CEO and founder of World. And sorry, that's Alina Dini, CEO and founder of World. Alina? You're, you're, yeah, you're right. Thanks, Laura. Thanks so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. I work with businesses, individuals, and communities to help them harness energy innovations. And as founder and CEO of World, which is a peer-based marketplace for reimagining the car buying experience, um, for electric cars, I, I work with individuals to help them identify the process and make it simpler. Um, as a researcher and consultant in the EV space for many years, I, I like to help bring a strategic focus to end users and consumers to help shape policy and marketplace direction to make it easier to access those technologies. So really excited to be here and provide that sort of consumer lens to uh, the policy discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alina. Okay, I'd like to welcome Tim Washington from Jet Charge. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Tim Washington. I'm the CEO of JetCharge. We're Australia's leading EV charging infrastructure deployment uh, specialist. We're the recommended charging partner for 17 vehicle brands in Australia and have participated in about 6,000 um, charger deployments. Um, I'm also the co-founder and director of ChargeFox, which is Australia's largest EV charging network. Um, and I'm also the chair of the Electric Vehicle Council, which is the electric vehicle's main um, business group representing a whole bunch of stakeholders um, in the country. So um, the perspective I bring today is from the people on the ground deploying charging infrastructure um, at the coalface, talking with customers, governments, uh, vehicle manufacturers, as well as at an overall macro policy level through my uh, role at the Electric Vehicle Council. Good to be here. Thanks very much, Tim. Michael Lee from Climateworks Australia, I'd like to welcome you. Thanks, Laura, and thank you for having us here. Um, so yeah, my name is Michael. I'm the Senior Project Manager for Sustainable Cities at Climateworks Australia. We're an independent, not-for-profit advisor that works within Monash University's Sustainable Development Institute. And we bridge the gap between research and decarbonisation opportunities and action by business and government. It's an exciting time for us at Climateworks to be talking about decarbonising the transport sector in particular because Within the transport sector, um, I guess our research shows that most of the solutions around decarbonisation are known, and many of these are ready to be implemented within the next decade. That time is important because it'll be crucial for Australia and the rest of the world to act before 2030 in order to limit global warming to below 1.5 degrees in line with the Paris Agreement on climate change. And so Climateworks is responding to this challenge by scaling up our own efforts to focus on transport systems and right now we're expanding our own team that will deliver a decarbonisation um, program for the transport sector over the next few years. We recognise though that there's a lot of work to be done um, across urban planning, road and rail infrastructure, freight, supply chains, including aviation shipping, uh, and of course accelerating the uptake of, uh, of zero emissions vehicles. 
just to give you a sense of the the sense of the um the huge transformation that's actually needed in this coming decade um we've modeled a range of scenarios for Australia's emissions pathways to align with limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. And they included a rapid decarbonisation of the electricity grid, plus EVs making up around 76% of new car sales by 2030 and 59% of new truck sales. And so really what we're focusing on in response to that is, um, uh, I guess what, and what we're keen to discuss through forums like this is setting out what's the whole policy suite um, that's required in order to enable an orderly transition to this vastly different vehicle fleet in line with Australia's international climate change commitments. So I'm very much looking forward to, to this discussion. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Michael. Thanks. And finally, I'd like to welcome Adrian Dwyer from Infrastructure Partnerships Australia to introduce himself. Hi, Laura. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm Adrian Dwyer. I'm the CEO of Infrastructure Partnerships Australia. We're a public policy think tank and member network. For the infrastructure sector, we're publicly and privately owned um, and we exist to shape better policy and infrastructure across energy, telecommunications, water, transport and social infrastructure. Um, we have a long term interest as an organisation in road user charging and road pricing reform for all vehicles and um, specifically in the recent past, looking at how you can both incentivise the uptake of electric vehicles, but also use them as an opportunity to change a, a broken system for the way we fund roads. So that's our specific interest in this area. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Adrian. Just before I that jump into the question, oh, uh, sorry, just, just make sure you're yeah. unmuted to not the uh, speaker. We've got, uh, just get the audience member. Yeah, thanks very much. Now, before I get into the first question, just a recommendation, you can change the setting to view who's talking just at the top ribbon of your page there. So if you would like to see the person speaking in large rather than a small image, you can ch change that setting at the top ribbon of your screen. Without further ado, uh, I'll put a very uh, broad question to, to you guys and, and I'd like to perhaps hear from Alina on this. To start with at least, what are the biggest barriers to low emission vehicle adoption by governments and consumers in Australia? Thanks, Laura. Look, that's a really important question, especially right now, because what we're seeing globally is, is a tipping point for EVs. And in spite of what happened last year with COVID, there really is a tremendous momentum with a great number of uh, OEMs or people who produce cars announcing that they're making a drastic shift to make only electric vehicles in coming years. So what's missing in Australia at the highest level is leadership, leadership and policy. And look, we've seen um, actions taken by state governments and taken by councils and a tremendous amount of work on the industry side to help consumers navigate what's going on in the marketplace. But we know there's consumer interest Despite the interest, there's a lack of confidence. And the confidence comes from this absence of leadership in government policy at the highest level. Um, now, the Commonwealth released a future fuels uh, strategy document for consultation, which is, is open right now. So it's important for anyone who has a particular view to, to chime in and underscore the importance of a strategic policy direction for Australia, because that strategic policy direction dic dictates an ecosystem of engagement from various levels of, of industry or um, a supply chain that would support a domestically um, produced electric vehicle industry. And that can range from domestic manufacturing, which we're seeing some of in the heavy vehicle sector, as well as a couple of players in the passenger vehicle sector, to charging infrastructure on um, both manufacture, as for example, with Tritium um, and operation, as, as we've got Tim here talking about the, the great work that Jet Charge have done over the years to, to really build that brand locally, and a couple of other players, straight through to aftermarket products and um, uh, offerings that are in, available in the marketplace strictly for electric vehicle customers. So Whirl is one example of a peer-to-peer -peer offering that enables access to test driving electric vehicles, but there are others. So for example, the Good Car Company, which provides imports from overseas, provides electric vehicles into the marketplace at a lower price point. Um, Everdy is another startup that provides charging infrastructure services, um, Australian uh, designed and, and made. So we have lots of activity going on here but a clear direction from government about a strategic policy for electric vehicles is what's necessary to help us get to that tipping point locally. Okay, thanks very much, Alina. I'm wondering, uh, Michael, if, if you've also 
got a perspective based on the research that you've done uh, on this question of the, the barriers to LEV adoption? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Laura. Um, I guess a lot of the research that we've done on um, various opportunities for EV and ZEV adoption has been focused on uh, fleets and in particular local government fleets. Um, and we see fleets um, as a big opportunity for supporting uptake of EVs in Australia, given every year around about half um, of new vehicle registrations um, in Australia uh, come from business and um, corporate and government fleets. Um, which means that um, there's a huge opportunity to, um, I guess, stimulate the market for new ZEV vehicles um, through the, those year-on-year -year registrations, but also um, uh, through the, the provision of um, cars into the second-hand market um, as those vehicles reach the end of their life within that kind of uh, corporate and government fleet setting. Um, having said that, um, we did some research two years ago with a range of local councils in Victoria around some of the um, the barriers around take up of um, ZEVs and battery EVs um, in particular in their fleets. Um, and a lot of them came down to um, information barriers um, and information and knowledge gaps. So um, uh, I guess information gaps around um, the ability of uh, sustainability and fleet teams in calculating the total cost of ownership, um, in particular comparing EVs with um, internal combustion um, engines. Um, the knowledge gap in, I guess, understanding the appropriate charging infrastructure that's needed uh, at council facilities, what charges to install, where to install them, what's the electrical wiring that's needed, um, and what management systems councils actually need to service that sort of transitioning fleet. Um, and also just from on the charging infrastructure side, it's, it, the feedback we got from those councils was that it's unclear what role councils and other levels of government and private providers should play in planning, investing in installing and operating charging infrastructure. So those councils that we surveyed saw value in having some sort of statewide or national approach to defining the role that councils can play in installing that charging infrastructure in order to help transition their own fleets, which has huge potential for um, uh, supporting, I guess, those local communities in um, uh, uptake of, of, of battery electric vehicles, uh, vehicles more, more broadly. Okay, great. Thanks, Michael. And I guess a theme there is that the different stakeholders involved in rolling out or encouraging uh, low emission vehicles not being clear on, on what to do. And, and that's good because later on we'll, we'll get to that question of what the different stakeholders can do to uh, encourage uptake and, and what, their, you know, what their responsibilities are might be. Uh, just on this question of, of broadly speaking barriers, did anyone else on the panel want to add anything that we might have missed? I think one thing that's um, often missing from a conversation about barriers is just how few barriers actually exist um, for people to purchase electric vehicles. I think one of the things that the industry gets itself into trouble with is we're constantly talking about barriers and when we start constantly talk about barriers, the perception is that an electric vehicle is always three years away. But I think we've seen that barriers to the um, purchase of electric vehicles, certainly starting at the kind of upper end of the market, which is kind of where technology always normally starts, have been kind of broken um, down for quite a long time. And a lot of the challenges we see around EV charger infrastructure, for example, um, are not as, I guess, extreme as people would say they are. I'll give you an example. In Australia, 70% of us have access to off-street parking, um, and therefore a lot of people who purchase electric vehicles have somewhere to charge, and therefore we have nowhere near the amount of challenges that um, European and Asian countries have in adopting electric vehicles, which requires extensive build-out of public charging infrastructure. And so I think one thing to be mindful of is to not always talk about barriers, but also to talk about the opportunities that people already have if they want to purchase an electric vehicle. Thanks for that, Tim. And you've foreshadowed a, a question about the Australian context, which I'll come back to shortly. I just want to ask uh, a question. I think this one might be suitable for you, Steve, and, and later for Adrian. And that is, how does the low emission vehicle tax, um, which was brought into the public discussion last year, how does that fit within the broader discussion of equitable road user charging? Because this is really what brought a spotlight into the more public arena of, of um, low emission vehicles. Uh, thanks, Laura. Look, it's a good question. And 
Um, Ivy's at Infrastructure Victoria, we've recently completed a, a deliberative engagement process with a panel of over 200 um, Victorians. And one of the things that came up uh, very early on in the discussion was the distance-based charge for low and zero emissions vehicles in Victoria and the impact that that could have on the cost effectiveness and therefore their, their uptake in the long run. Um, so we know it's something that uh, is a hot topic for a lot of people. Um, so Infrastructure Victoria has a long history of kind of recommending uh, Road user, you know, user charges for road use, either distance-based charges or congestion charging. Um, and now, in our draft strategy, we recommended a distance-based charge be applied for zero emissions vehicles, um, specifically in the context of uh, charging uh, user charges for all vehicle types. But the um, distinction we made for zero emissions vehicles was that any road user charges should be offset by discounts to the upfront purchase cost of um, lower zero emissions vehicles, particularly because it's the sticker price that's often the bigger barrier to be. Um, we know that the, excuse me, there's a bit of background noise in my place. Uh, we know that the um, total cost of ownership, you know, the usage cost per kilometre of a low and zero emissions vehicle is often a fraction that we use for a, an internal combustion engine vehicle. So uh, even without that, um, even with, I should say, the distance based charge applied those vehicles are much more cost effective to use. Um, and equally, it's not so much a question about, uh, often it's been framed in a revenue raising capacity, but really it's a question about the most efficient use of the asset, the asset of course being the road. At the moment, you know, um, the, ro the roads aren't used as efficiently as they could be because people don't pay the full price of their use. Now, uh, <clears throat> a distance pay charge for zero emissions vehicles is, um, is one way to, 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 I guess, open up or, you know, it's a thin end of the wedge, I guess, on distance-based charging or user charges for roads that can over time grow as the vehicle fleet grows. And um, you can achieve a much more efficient and uh, better use of the transport network, not just roads, but also public transport and active transport and other modes of transport by just pricing them more effectively. Thanks for that, Steve. Adrian, did you want to, to add anything to that, that question? Yeah, I might, I might just um, pick up on a point Tim made earlier and just because I completely agree. He was saying that electric vehicles, uh, there's a danger we talk about that it seems like electric vehicles are three years away. I think I'd add to it is the conflation of connected and autonomous vehicles with electrification is a major issue. They're often, they often get spoken about in the same sentence. And we had the sort of the hype cycle with um, connected and autonomous vehicles that OEMs have pulled away a bit from, um, particularly over COVID, but, but before that, and, and they're probably a bit further away than the hype suggested. And that often gets, electric vehicles get caught in with that. And there's a perception that they're further away than they are when, as Tim said, they're here and now and the actual barriers aren't, uh, beyond sticker price, aren't as, um, as severe as is perhaps presented. Um, on the um, electric vehicle road user charging piece, um, it's an idea that, that we incubated, but it needs to be put into context, which is um, a, a long agreement amongst um, transport professionals and economists and reformers that um, we need to have a, a better system for charging for roads than we currently have. So we currently have fuel excise, which goes to consolidated revenue at the federal level. Um, that is um, uh, distributed to some extent back to the states through contributions from the federal government, either as um, broad contributions to the states or specific investments on behalf of Commonwealth taxpayer into state-based projects. Um, There's very little linkage between usage and consumption, um, and it's a pretty poor system. It's unsustainable. It's inefficient. Uh, it's unfair. Um, so economists over time have agreed that a, a distance-based charge, perhaps in the future with um, demand-based elements and, and other factors in, so mass distance location-based charging is the, the good long-term outcome. And um, those of us that believe in this have been banging our head against a brick wall for the last 20 years, trying to get a politician to um, step up and do that. And of course, they all said no, because um, fuel excise is quite good. If you're at the federal government level, you collect it from a small number of fuel holes at, wholesalers, um, it's a hidden tax, um, people don't know they're paying it, and actually it, whilst it's declining because of um, uh, the vehicle fleet getting more efficient, it's declining very slowly and it's sort of someone else's problem in the future. Plus, um, in the past it's been conflated with things like um, privacy issues around um, 
you know, sticking a little black box in everybody's car and recording where they're going would have been the only way to um, capture the revenue. Um, so it, it, we really didn't make any progress with it. But what's happened over the last few years is the inevitability of electrification means that actually there's an opportunity, as Steve said, to, to get in at the thin end of a technology wedge and um, and get a, a, a put in place now a better system that in 20 years time when we don't call them electric vehicles or ZEVs, we just call them cars because they're all electric, um, we'll have got a, 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 a better, not perfect, but a better road usage charging system than we currently have. Um, what I would say what's been lost in some of the public debate on this is that um, we fairly explicitly think it should also be combined with upfront incentives. Uh, we think they should be targeted against um, the sticker price. They should exist but decline towards price parity. They should conspicuously offset any charge that a road user charge would put in place. But we want a situation where price parity in 2025, 2026 means that you go into a dealership and you have one car that attracts fuel excise and one that attracts a, a distance based charge and you make your decision uh, based on the electric one simply being a better solution to personal mobility um, rather than um, sticker price impacting that or, or whatever else it may be. And that we've got a way of paying for roads, roads into the future because the reality is um, electric vehicles still use roads, they still use the assets, they won't float and, and they should pay to use the roads uh, not, uh, not only now but into the future as well. Okay, thanks, Adrian. Uh, a lot of dimensions to that there, and I think it seems like the the EV tax has catalyzed a discussion about a broader system, a way of uh, charging for road use. That is, um, Laura. Is sorry, I don't. I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I just kind of before we move away from the topic, yeah. you won't be surprised to know that the EV Council has very strong views on a road user charge. Um, yeah. And um, I think the biggest problem here is that we're conflating a broader road user charge discussion with what's actually being proposed by various state governments at the moment, which is not a broader reform around road user charge, rather it is a tax on electric vehicles. And I think that's where the EV Council is coming from to say, we've never had a problem working with the broader community on a road user charge for all vehicles, but what's pro being proposed today is not that. It is a road user charge only for electric vehicles. Um, and whilst I think the structural elements in Australia don't prohibit the sale of electric vehicles and that the barriers are not as high as some would say, that doesn't contemplate an active disincentive to purchase electric vehicles. And I think Adrian's hope for um, price parity in 2025 and 2027 is something that I share, um, but we're simply not going to get there if manufacturers are not incentivized to sell vehicles here and they won't be incentivized to sell vehicles here we're the only country that actively disincentivizes EVs. But I'm very encouraged to hear, and I think Adrian's right, what's been lost in the public debate is Adrian advocating for an upfront incentive to offset the road user charge. Um, and I'm very encouraged to hear that today as well. I might, just, um, I might just come in on, on that, Laura, because I think one of, the, one of the things that's also been lost in the public debate is that actually, um, if you imagine a future where we have um, a, a, a sticker price incentive that encourages the purchase of an electric vehicle alongside a, a modest distance based charge that is equal and equivalent to fuel excise for a similar vehicle um, what, and that, that being levied at the state level, what you do is tie the state government to wanting to incentivise electric vehicle kilometres travelled over internal combustion engine vehicle kilometers traveled because they get a revenue stream from that in the way they don't get from fuel excise. So it is actually quite a nice incentive mechanism that will um, put state governments in the same boat as, as manufacturers and charging infrastructure providers and the broader electric vehicle industry to say, well, what are the other barriers that we as a state government um, can help to address what are the levers that we can pull to encourage electric vehicle uptake in a way that doesn't exist at the moment because actually state governments have um, limited incentives for electrification beyond their um, decarbonisation targets and of course very limited incentives from the Commonwealth Government as well. So there is actually quite a nice mechanism that can exist here if we have upfront incentives while there is a, a sticker price difference, we have the road user charging in place and then we have everybody on the same page wanting to electrify the vehicle fleet but also make sure that we can continue to pay for the infrastructure that will support those vehicles not just now but decades into the future. 
Sorry, Laura, can I just add something commenting on what Adrian said and bringing it back to our first question, which is if we're looking at barriers to adoption for electric vehicles from the consumer level, because what we often have happen here in these discussions is we're talking to each other at an industry level. But when it comes down to the person who's at the storefront buying a car and they experience the feeling of an additional tax without the knowledge of that full ecosystem that was intended, then it becomes a disincentive for purchase and, and through that, a hindrance to the marketplace. So Adrian, I would just say to you, if you're controlling the narrative around your advice in the in the public marketplace, how can we how can we elicit that message that there is a carrot and a stick approach that's recommended here that will actually help the marketplace not only achieve greater elect electrification, but also achieve that revenue stream that you are seeking? Yeah, I think I think it's a good point. Although I do think we need to have a, a probably a, a generally more mature debate about what um, what public policy looks like, and and instead of everybody standing at, at ten paces with handbags, actually to say, well, it's not an unreasonable proposition that people should pay to use assets, and that maybe uh, that's all um, all users of um, those assets. And I agree with Tim. We should be having a debate about. Um, broader road user charging. In fact, some of us have been having that debate for the best part of 20 years and have made no progress. So actually, how do you get um, incremental reform in place, making sure that you don't um, you don't disincentivize uptake of electric vehicles, but you do get in place a system that in 20 years time when um, hopefully all vehicles are electric or at least don't use fossil fuels, that we can um, we can have a sustainable, better system than the one we have right now. I think there is a space here where actually um, none of us are that far apart. Right? It, it's just a timing issue between um, now and price parity. And of course, you overcome that by having the incentives up front. The great news is it's only because we're talking about a road user charge that there are serious discussions happening at the right level of government around incentivizing electric vehicles. So I think that's a positive thing, that this is the opportunity to get the incentives that we want, but combining them with a sustainable funding system. Okay, th thanks all for, for those different views on that. And I just want to shift a little bit and consider the counterfactual. So if we were in a situation where we did find that there were incentives for uptake of electric vehicles, whether that is the desirable outcome, is there an opportunity cost? And maybe Anje, you could uh, address the question as to whether we would get better emission reduction and economic health and social outcomes per dollar invested by investing in other forms of transportation, and other forms of infrastructure? Yeah, thanks for that question. Obviously for us, uh, we're in the position that public transport is the most effective way to move a large number of people efficiently. So we come at it from a slightly different angle. So for us, it's not an either or, but it's an in tandem. Uh, just touching back on what I said about our mission to redefine public transport, meaning basically everything but uh, the single use pa uh, private passenger vehicle. So with respect to zero emissions, there's no doubt that a reduction in the use of diesel and other fossil fuels will reduce overall emissions in the transport sector. So if the average bus uh, burns around 7,000 liters of diesel a year, which is equating to 18 tons of CO2, um, imagine the difference that would make uh, in a city at scale. So if cars are responsible for roughly half of Australia's transport emissions, that means that there's still a significant percentage coming from the public transport sector, which in turn means that there should definitely be a concentrated effort to reduce emissions in public transport. Thanks for that, Anjé. Steve, did you have anything to add on, on that topic about the opportunity cost of subsidy? Yeah, uh, so I mean, you've, you've used kind of the key word there, there's an opportunity cost here. So um, we think that there are two approaches really. So it doesn't necessarily always need to be an investment in new infrastructure that, that addresses the issue. We think, um, you know, in, in line with uh, pr better pricing signals for road use, also a better approach to pricing public transport use can actually promote public transport uptake um, as an alternative to uh, passenger vehicle use. Um, but equally, uh, when, the, when we're looking at, uh, you know, investing in public transport infrastructure versus um, subsidies or other ways of boosting ZDB uptake, um, 
the vast proportion of transport emissions uh, in Australia come from cars. And uh, while we can shift people from cars onto public transport, there will always be cars on the road and probably quite a lot of cars on the road. So uh, investments in um, transitioning people away from ICE vehicles into zero emissions vehicles or low emissions vehicles, um, particularly at the at the early stages um, where uptake can accelerate dramatically and make a, a, a big difference relative to where we are now, um, is probably uh, has potential to certainly have a better payoff in the short term than um, some marginal additional investment in, say, public transport infrastructure. Mm. Yeah, thanks for expanding that that perspective, and it's definitely worth considering the yeah the, what we might be trading off. I just want to double back to a point that Tim started to make earlier, and that is um, about the misconception that there are barriers, and specifically in relation to the Australian context. So, Tim, maybe do you have anything more to add regarding how we break the perception that low emission vehicles or zero emission vehicles won't work in Australia because Australia is different to other countries? Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly what I meant, Laura, where I said we kind of go too hard on barriers in that there are a lot of naysayers who they say who say Australia structurally as a country does not support electric vehicles, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But um, having been doing this for the past eight years and kind of going from an environment where there are literally no EVs on the road, it's, it is it is something that requires constant education. But there are lots of things going for Australia that means that if the manufacturer could actually get the vehicles here and the way they do that is by making a business case just like any other business case to their head office to say, hey, bring the cars to Australia, we can sell it. But if they are able to get it here, what they will find is uh, a country that has short driving distances, 35 to 50 kilometres per day, an abundance of off-street parking where we can install um, charging infrastructure, and a country that's powered um, a lot by renewable electricity, particularly rooftop solar. Um, and I think in the local environment, what we tend to do is to focus on the negatives and go, well, you know, Australia is a large country, we drive long distances, you know, how are you gonna get across the Nullarbor? But I think a lot of the work that Alina is doing, for example, is saying to consumers and educating consumers on how practical an electric vehicle can be on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, I, and I think we should, we should exploit our advantages, particularly when it comes to things like rooftop solar and renewable energy as a very cheap and of course um, cost-effective and um, renewable way to charge an electric vehicle. But the first thing we need to do is to make sure the cars get here. And unless the cars can get here in big numbers, we're not gonna see the price advantages that we will need for mass adoption of electric vehicles. But once they do get here, I think we are more suitable than anyone um, to accelerate EV adoption. And to give you an example of that, only three or four years ago, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, who globally leads work on research into electric vehicles, actually used percentage of off-street parking as a corollary factor for how fast EV adoption will occur in a country because they saw private charging as a major kind of um, issue for a lot of countries. And given that we have one of the highest rates of off-street parking in the world, we're actually a really great country for the adoption of electric vehicles. Great, so thanks, thanks for that, Chris, for thought. You're flipping it around. Oh yeah, Alina, did you want to? Yeah, just a quick thing um, to what Tim said that I think is really important for everyone to uh, have a think about, especially if you haven't driven an EV, because I drove my first EV, if you can believe it, 15 years ago. Like, is that even possible? Um, and, and the thing is that electric vehicles are actually really fun. So they unlock tremendous potential as an interactive um, connector into the grid, onboard storage and a battery that, that enhances the renewable energy offering in Australia. Um, but, but the really important thing about EVs that's often missed in this conversation about barriers is that they're actually really fun. They're enjoyable to drive for their, their quiet peacefulness, um, as well as their, their sort of zippy, almost roller coaster like function. Um, and, and they become a lifestyle choice for people like me who want to walk the talk about the lifestyle that I want to lead for myself and for my family and that I want to see in others. So I think there's tremendous potential to unlock all of those elements um, by, by giving them a try. Mm. Okay, thanks Alina. And we'll come back to your point, Tim, about needing to first get the EVs here. We might deal with that on a sector by sector approach. I'll come back to that 
And I just want to ask Angers if you had any points to add about this question about Australian context. I do. I think from the public transport perspective, this is interesting. Uh, we ran a forum in October and November last year just to understand what the challenges were and opportunities uh, in transforming then the fleet uh, to zero emissions in terms of bus. And one of the common threads that we found as a response to the challenges is geography. Uh, but we also found that this challenge was not uh, unique to Australia or New Zealand. This was global. Uh, geog geographical challenges are part and par parcel of operating a network and uh, transition to zero emissions isn't immune to that. Uh, so public transport authorities are, and operators look at the terrain when considering what choices that they're making in fleet, uh, considering hydrogen, battery electric, a combination of both, and then the location of the charging infrastructure. So saying that, I guess, you know, zero emission uh, vehicles won't work in Australia because it's Australia is just not a, a good enough argument. Um, we've seen successful implementation of zero emission buses in places such as Singapore and Dubai with their severe temperatures. We've seen successful um, implementation in places like Spain with very hilly terrain uh, and successful bu bus fleets running around China and the UK tracking uh, kilometer upon kilometer, overcoming then the range anxiety, which seems to be uh, a common perception barrier in terms of zero emission buses or zero emission vehicles. Uh, so there's no reason why we can't take some of these learnings from overseas where they have had successful implementation for a number of years and at scale and apply them in the Australian context. And that's how we overcome that perception. Thanks so much for sharing yeah, the diversity of of experiences from other countries that you've been um, involved in, in working with or heard from. Uh, the next question that I have is regarding the policies or subsidies needed to deliver the supporting infrastructure for EVs in Australia. And Tim, I'm wondering if you have anything to say to that. Yeah, absolutely. So one part um, that um, the federal government as well as various state governments have had a big part to play is in um, infrastructure investment. Um, and so through the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, um, the federal government has invested tens of millions into charging companies creating highways. Um, and they've also released the Future Fuels Fund, um, which is 76 million or so. And a big part of that is going to charge infrastructure for electric vehicles. There's currently a, um, a tender out at the moment um, for anyone who's interested offering 16 million for metro charging um, as well. The state governments all have plans around investment in charging infrastructure. And I think in the current political environment, infrastructure is very much a kind of a political topic. Everybody loves infrastructure, you know, in the US until recently, every week was infrastructure week, you know, so that's kind of, it's something that everybody loves, not everyone understands, but everyone kind of views as neither left nor right. So we focused a lot on infrastructure. Um, so I think we're actually, you know, even though our investment in EV charger infrastructure kind of pales in comparison to equivalent countries um, globally, it's, it's certainly a really, um, it's an area where the government is focusing their efforts in terms of incentives for electric vehicles. Um, and so, you know, is there more that they can do always? But I think it's an area where they've really concentrated on for the past few years. Thanks for that. Did anyone else on the panel want to add anything just around the question of bringing the infrastructure needed to support EV uptake in Australia? We'll move on to the other issue there, which is about how to get greater market penetration of EVs. We can take this on a sector by sector approach. We might look at the well, the role of government in that specifically. Um, unless anyone wants to just broadly answer this question around what can be done to speed up market penetration of EVs in Australia. Yeah, yeah I might jump in here just to yeah, just to um, touch on the conversation before around subsidies and I guess Adrian's point from earlier around um, uh, the the value of subsidies while um, the ticket price of EVs is higher than um, the internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, and I guess something that uh, gets um, sometimes missed in the debate around subsidies and the value of subsidising um, EV take-up, investing in EV take-up is um, that it's not just about um, investing in the vehicles themselves, but it's also about investing in 
the market transformation that's required in order to actually provide support for consumers to change their vehicle choice, to encourage more vehicle manufacturers to bring more EV models to the market, into the Australian market, and um, to motivate the sort of associated investment in charging infrastructure, in skills and training for, for car mechanics and other trades um, associated with EVs. And so, and that's particularly important, you know, again, building that market and, and transforming the market for vehicles and for EVs in Australia until that price parity is reached. And then after that point, um, there's um, potential for those subsidies and for that investment to wind back. And that's actually, um, we've seen, we started seeing some evidence of that in other countries where um, the markets locally have matured enough that, um, for example, the US state of Colorado, the UK, China, just a few examples of jurisdictions where they've started winding back um, upfront tax credits and upfront vehicle purchase subsidies in response to, um, I guess, the growth of EVs in their market and, and the reduction in, in, in sticker prices um, um, in line with that. So I think, um, yeah, it's, I guess when talking about subsidies, it's not just about the investment in the vehicles themselves and the emissions reductions from that, but it's that market transformation piece that's really important as well. Yeah, thanks for that, Michael. That brings it back to the barriers that you mentioned at the start and the sheer complexity of uh, coordination and logistics and, and a lack of uh, knowledge and mature knowledge across Australia of how to do this. And I think it's really interesting that you note that incentives are needed not just for consumers, which is what I think the main dialogue has been around, but around other stakeholders in the industry to actually bring about um, all aspects of, of what is needed for EVs. So I think that's a really important point that, that we can't leave out of the discussion. I'm glad that you did bring it round to the consumer side of things though in, in what you were saying because an important question is what else can be done and what is needed to encourage consumers to transition to low emission vehicles and I think we have quite a few um, perspectives on the panel on this question and Steve I might ask you what, what you found about this. Excellent. Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, so as I, as I said earlier, we're fresh off the back of a um, kind of five and a half week uh, engagement process with a bunch of Victorian community members. And, um, you know, the, the things that they threw up as being barriers to uptake are very similar to things we've spoken about here, and they're the kind of the same things that bubble up in um, much of the research that you read. It's, uh, you know, price, range anxiety and availability of charging infrastructure. Those are kind of the three key barriers. And the thing is, um, all three of those, to a greater or less extent, uh, are almost more imagined than real. So price, for example, yes, the sticker price of a, of a ZEV is higher than an ICE vehicle, but the total cost of ownership tends to be less, if not now, certainly in a couple of years, but I think in most cases now, the total cost of ownership is lower. Um, you know, range anxiety, uh, given that, you know, 90 plus percent of trips are kind of around 35 kilometres per day, um, you know, that well within the range of uh, even your smallest battery EV. So range anxiety is much less of an issue for everyday trips. It's really only the edge cases where people are driving into state um, where range anxiety will be an issue. And of course, availability of charging infrastructure is tied in with that range anxiety. Um, you know, over 90% of um, charging will occur at the home. We've got some of the highest rates of off-street parking available in the world. Um, and you can, you, know, you can plug in your car overnight and it charges. So that's a, that's a really long way of saying that actually um, one of the big things that we can do is just raise awareness. Uh, people have all of these um, concerns or perceived barriers to ZDB uptake that actually when you dig into what's driving them and the, the, how realistic those barriers are, actually they don't really exist, um, certainly not to the extent that, that people perceive them to. Just on that point and, and about barriers, I think we've just had a valid question pop into the chat, um, and that's just about framing this for regional consumers as well as Metro. Do the, are the barriers greater for, for regional um, card prospective EV drivers? Certainly from the range perspective, you would have to say uh, that is more of an issue, but um, I would say, you know, for re people living in regional towns and cities, um, unless they're kind of rural, people living in rural Australia who are travelling two to 300 kilometres plus per day, um, that's still, I think, a relatively small proportion of vehicle users without kind of having the data off the top of my head. I think that 
still the vast majority of people living in regional Australia probably don't travel over 300 kilometres a day. Yeah, great. Thanks for that clarification. Adrian, did you want to add anything on this question around consumer incentives? Oh, I was just going to so – it seems a bit flippant, but to echo what Steve was saying, the most effective thing to increase uptake of electric vehicles is seeing your neighbour get one. We talk to the likes of Tesla and they say you almost see the purchases happening in a, in a, a street that one person will get them and then the area expands. And it's not because – it's not jealousy or – you know, someone's got a shiny new car. It's because you see someone that looks a lot like you, um, presumably because they live next door to you, have a you know, similar degree of affluence, et cetera, and they've got one and it works for them. So actually that that's quite instructive in the sense that it means that you can start to think about how do you target any incentive or subsidy um, or, or other broader incentives to actually encourage uptake in the right way. So it's, you know, for instance, um, do, do we really want to incentivize uh, a two hundred thousand dollar Porsche, or would we be better off putting a larger incentive against, um, you say, the the new MG SUV that's at forty three thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars, and and actually try and encourage the right parts of the market to bring the mass market component rather than um, this forever being a sort of high end product. So we can you can look at. You can look at all of these factors and use them to calibrate the right way to do incentives rather than just sort of a, a blanket approach. Great. Thanks for that, Adrian. With, I also think that with, with the right, Laura, with the right kind of um, pricing centres and manufacturers pushes, what we've seen from overseas is that the barriers to purchase for um, consumers is actually not as high as we think it is. Um, and you know, in the UK, for example, they went from 2.2% of new vehicle sales in June 2019 to 23.4% of new vehicle sales in December 2020. Um, and that was because of the new CO2 emissions rules that came in in Europe that required that. And I understand that from a policy level, but all of those vehicles or most of those vehicles went to people. They went to consumers. They went to fleets, which means that when the price is right, people will purchase them. Um, so I don't think consumers really are the issue. Like we will, we need to continuously educate consumers on how great and fun electric vehicles are. But when the rubber hits the road and the price is right, they will purchase, um, as we've seen from overseas. Thanks, Tim. And perhaps a, a lingering question here is how we bring the price down through, how do we get the market penetration considering Australia is such a small market? And I did see another question and we've received that question many times. How do we get the market penetration in Australia that will result in the, the bringing down of the cost and the greater range of vehicles available to consumers? And perhaps we can use the little time that we have left to look at the role of the private sector and also the role of government in carrying that out. So firstly, to the role of the private sector and the opportunities of the private sector. Uh, Alina, did you have any insights you can share with us on that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, if it's all right, I'll just draw on some of the discussion that's happened just before. Um, for for any person to take a, a vested interest in the electric vehicle market, whether it's buying one or having their business participate, is taking on the psychological risk. You know, it's we know the traditional car model really well, the refueling ecosystem that exists around that and all of the sort of affiliated industries, insurance, warranties, servicing, um, it all makes a lot of sense. But when you change the, the sort of technology to electric, it becomes a little bit different and, and there's more risk there. So in terms of what industry can do, I think we have to look beyond the energy industry and beyond the transport in industry and look toward other industries that are affiliate and give them confidence to support this ecosystem. So one really great example is the finance sector. Um, you know, you can access an electric vehicle in a number of ways. One is you can buy it outright. Another is you can borrow to own it. Another is you can rent or lease it. Um, and there are new business models coming in that can bring broader offerings. So for example, AGL has a subscription model where you can buy into the concept of an electric vehicle, including a charger and a retail electricity account for a nominal monthly fee before you're confident to take on the full risk of ownership. Another offering is one provided by a peer company of worlds called EV, EVEE, -E, where you can hire out an electric vehicle for a weekend and really understand what it means to operate it without taking on the risk of having to have it for six months. So I think we're seeing new business models emerge that give customers access 
And the one that I'm proposing through Whirl is just taking it for a whirl through your, your neighbor's electric vehicle for half an hour, um, not having to go to the, the car dealership and have the full sales experience, but just really understand what the technology can be like. So welcoming in new market entrants, as well as supporting the sort of uh, historical tenants of our economy and how they can use their existing mechanisms to support electric vehicle adoption will help grow the marketplace. Thanks, Alina. And I'm sure there's a role for government there as well, but we'll get to that in a sec. Ange, did you have anything to add regarding the role of the private sector? Yes, a few things. I think that um, first, I'd just like to touch back on something that Adrian said about peer pressure as a good motivator to uh, incentivize uptake. I think analogous to that in the public transport sector is this uh, concept of social license to operate. So uh, when you see jurisdictions like New South Wales saying we're going to transition 8,000 electric buses, then that's going to you know, have flow on effects to some of the other jurisdictions and the customers there saying, you know, well, why can't we have electric buses? So that's going to be uh, part of that conversation. I think government, um, the, the role of government um, is really just uh, to, to set those clear indications to market that they're going to go through uh, with this transition and then also uh, making those clear commitments to the targets uh, so that then industry in turn can drive the innovation. So I think that's the proper balance of the role of government and the role of industry. And then uh, one of the last points I wanted to touch on really is the, the cost perspective. Uh, so we know that in, in the world of um, purchasing, buying a bus uh, is a little bit different from buying a car, uh, but our findings from our forum suggest that we are close to total cost parity in terms of electric buses, but the metrics by which those costs are measured have to be adjusted to account for other factors, uh, such as what Joe Ma, who operates the world's largest electric bus fleet in the world, about six, 16,000 electric buses would say, is creative accounting. So in Shenzhen, China, where Joe works, there's an eight-year life expectancy for a bus uh, as there is a mandate to keep buses new. So money's being saved via maintenance and energy costs despite the higher capital investment. Uh, and he shared that in 2017, uh, the bus purchase demonstrated a major TCO drop from when they started their electrification journey in 20, in 2013. So it's generally recognized that CapEx costs will be higher in the medium to long term. However, operational costs uh, are looking to be lower in terms of maintenance. And then when you factor things in like uh, environmental and air quality benefits, even lower. Um, so looking at the work uh, done by Auckland Transport, for example, saying that um, they calculated the cumulative value in terms of air emission and noise reduction to be over 166 million New Zealand dollars. When you start hearing those stories come through, then it's going to be, I think, um, an impetus from many angles that are going to drive the transition to zero emissions. Thank you, Ange. And it's almost worth another debate there to look at structural issues in the way we maybe account or incentivize, not, not monetarily, but in other ways um, for different forms of transport and, and low emission vehicles. I'll take one more response from the panel, if you have one, regarding the role of government, because we haven't quite been explicit on this point, but what is government's role in incentivizing the transition? Um, I'm happy to just continue on. I guess the, expect, the expectation is that there needs to be a consensus and a whole of government approach in setting clear targets and um, signaling to industry that we're ready to prepare for this transition. That um, flows on nicely from a lot of the comments we're getting, which is that there is a lack of awareness, knowledge, and just general literacy around electric vehicles out there in Australia. And so perhaps uh, well, leadership is one thing that can be done, but information of various forms um, distributing that on is also seems to be needed. Uh, a final chance for comments from the panel. It, I might just say fleet buying, um, both of, of corporate Australia and public sector have huge fleets and they can make a decisive decision to move into electrification and then those vehicles owned for a relatively short period of time then become secondhand vehicles um, in the um, in, in the, the electric vehicles in the second-hand market, which um, removes that first price parity um, or sticker price issue. So uh, and they are moving on that, and there's issues around availability, but 
Um, every government in Australia has a huge fleet of cars. At least a portion of those can be moved to electric. Yeah, that's a, a very important point. Thanks for Adrian. In terms of closing comments, Laura, I'll just reiterate that I think leadership and signaling a specific direction that is in favor of electric vehicles in Australia is what's necessary. If we tell the rest of the world that the doors are open to electrification and that we see opportunity, that the supply will come um, and, and the consumer demand will respond in kind. So I think it's really about sending that signal through, through strong leadership. Thanks very much, Elaine. Um, Laura, I guess my parting comment is one thing that often gets missing all of these discussions is the ability for Australian industry to partake in this several once in several generation change. Everything we've talked about today has pretty much been based on the assumption that we will purchase everything from overseas. Um, and you know there are a couple of manufacturers here in Australia, niche ones, and a major charging manufacturer in Tritium, but that's it. And if you consider that somewhere like China is basing a big part of their economic recovery on leading the electric vehicle race by building up their own industry and take advantage of this race, it really begs the question for Australian politicians, you know, what are we doing to actually encourage intellectual property creation in Australia to actually play some part in um, the electric vehicle transition? It's not just about um, lowering the price to consume other people's things. It's about finding a way to create things ourselves. And I think we need to have an environment that's more aspirational about our role in the world and our role when it comes to electric vehicles, not only in producing the vehicles themselves, but also in creating world leading software, firmware and parts so that the rest of the world can benefit from our expertise and knowledge. We have amazing universities, amazing, amazing engineers, but none of them are encouraged to go into low emission fields apart from the small number of people here today, simply because their government tells them, we're not interested in this, we don't, we don't see this as an opportunity. I think we need to change that tone. Mm, thanks very much, Tim. In the interest of hearing from our final two panellists with some closing comments. We're going to take this for another two minutes and I'll ask Michael, did you want to have any closing comments? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, while we're all throwing them in, um, I'll just re-emphasize re a point I made earlier about the scale of the transformation um, that would be needed in the transport sector to align with Australia's climate change commitments, particularly around limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, we have a scenario. We have a scenario that models 75% um, of or 76% of new car sales in 2030 um, being electric vehicles to um, align with that 1.5 degree scenario. And what that shows is that first of all, the transformation is huge. It's a, it's a whole scale change in the way that the the, the 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 car market has worked from the way it has for the past century. Um, but also the modelling shows that it's actually, it's actually possible as well. And so all the discussions that we've had today are really important um, discussions to have in order to actually help support that future. Thanks very much, Michael. And and lastly, Steve, did you want to add a final comment? Just briefly, I'd like to um, second Elena's comment from before, the importance of signalling. So, uh, you know, there's a bit of a dearth of policy direction when it comes to ZEV uptake uh, in Australia at the moment. And, you know, simple things like setting targets or, you know, providing uh, subsidies to purchase, no matter, however small, um, sends a signal to the market that, you know, Australia is open to and uh, actively wants to uh, promote EV uptake, which would encourage, you'd have to think, manufacturers to send more um, vehicles into the market, which would increase the range of available vehicles for consumers and lead to greater uptake. So I just think that um, a real uh, strong signal from government that we're open to uh, low and zero emissions vehicles would, uh, would be a great first step and have a significant impact. Thank you very much, Steve. Well, I'd invite all of the audience members to join me in thanking our panelists today. Uh, you've opened up so many different aspects of this discussion and certainly enlightened me and, and I'm sure as well all of our audience members. So I'm really grateful for the, the fruitful discussion, the, the diverse perspectives that we've heard today. And thank you, thank you very much for taking the time. And to our audience, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your questions. I know we couldn't get to them all, but they were fantastic and we've had a really robust conversation. So thank you all so much. Thank you.
You will be able to access the recording of today's panel discussion um, shortly on the website. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Laura.